Guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get, let's face it, the world's most interesting folks who are building the future. Today, we've got somebody doing absolutely that, Pierre Baru on the program. I know I'm saying it wrong, but that's okay because we'll cut this out anyways. Thanks for coming today, Pierre. Thanks for having me. So AI and creativity, you, you built Ava. Tell me, what's your background real quick? How did you get into the AI space? Are you an artist? Are you a technologist? What's your story? So I'm both actually. So I uh, originally, I, I grew up in a family of artists. So my father is a film and music producer. My mother is a singer. I, you know, I, I picked up the arts quite uh, early on. So I, I self-taught myself a piano. Uh, I co-directed a four, uh, four film documentary series with my dad when I was 15 years old. So I always had a huge interest for the arts. And, uh, and then I studied computer science at university, uh, which led me to, uh, to sort of want to do more in technology and, uh, and then eventually I watched this, uh, this science fiction film, Her, where an AI composes music. And that was sort of the, the trigger for, you know, the intersection of both my arts interest and my technology interest to collide and, and create this project. So you're a little bit of a dichotomy. You're, you're a unicorn, so to speak. And that's kind of what you're building towards. You're building Ava, essentially the Mozart of today, but in a laptop. Tell me, tell me a little bit about Ava, and then let's get into what actually you're doing and what that looks like in the future. Sure. So Ava is basically a, an artificial intelligence uh, based on deep, deep neural networks, deep learning and machine, learn, machine learning that basically has learned uh, the art of music composition by reading 30,000 scores of the best composers out there. So the likes of Mozart, Bach, Beethoven, but also Stravinsky, um, you know, um, uh, Wagner and, and so on. And basically, it's, it's by analyzing all those 30,000 pieces of music that, that Ava picks up rules of music, because there's actually a lot of rules in music, you know, rules in harmony and rhythm and so on. And, and, and then it's able to create totally original music, original soundtracks, whether that's for video games or uh, you know, uh, films, or even we actually have a lot of composers using our product uh, as, a, as a sort of influence and uh, inspiration tool. Uh, so the, the applications for, for you know, this technology are quite wide range. So I've heard it said that, sure, there's the rules, but the greats are the ones who can break the rules and make it even better because of it. I know as an aspiring author, you hear all of these different rules, but at the same time, you'll read some of the best books of all time and they completely upend that. How do you think about these rules that Ava or other AI systems learn and then when or how to train them to overcome those? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And uh, most of the time, what the rules that we teach to our algorithm, or to, at least we try to, uh, to get the algorithm to learn from the data, is basically the rules that will allow the system to understand how to create good music. Uh, and by good music, I mean basically going through this threshold after which uh, it's not necessarily objective to say that a piece of music will be better uh, or not. Like uh, creating good music is really creating music that makes sense that is coherent and is pleasing to the human ear, whether or not you like that style of music. Um, and then creative, uh, cr creating better music is when you reach the subjective realm where uh, you may prefer, let's say, Beethoven music instead of the Beatles, just because you have a preference for classical music. And that's totally subjective. And, and I think this is where um, breaking the rules actually comes in. It's once you have reached that sort of uh, that threshold of, of quality of music, you've, you've uh, followed sufficient, uh, sufficient amount of rules about, about, for example, the structure of the music, you are then able to actually break some rules in order to, to bring some sort of a creative aspect to your work. And, um, and the, the way that we actually um, train Ava to do that, to follow the rules, to create good music and then break them to create better than good music, uh, is by actually uh, you know, introducing some kind of noise in the system. And, and that's, uh, that's, uh, that noise is, is actually um, definitely part of, uh, of any machine learning uh, training system. Uh, it's that, that serendipity that allows it to create uh, you know, music that's not just good, but actually better. So you bring up objective and subjective goodness for music. And it makes me think of visual aesthetics. So we've probably all heard of the golden, the golden ratio, the 1.618 something to one, where you see it in rectangles, you see it in the shape of guys' shoulders and hips, you see it in all sorts of kind all sorts of things. And it seems to be the most visually appealing of ratios. Is there something similar in music when you bring up the objective and the subjective value? So there's definitely a uh, similar trends in music. For example, one, one such trend that you don't want to break is uh, 
um, or at least in most cases, you don't want to break is rep the repetitiveness. Uh, actually, being repetitive in music is a, is a sort of a, a way to ensure that people will rem remember the theme of music that you're trying to build up. And it will create an emotional connection because if you always change the musical material without having a sort of hook, it's, it becomes really hard to connect with the music and, and to, to sit, sing along essentially. Um, so for example, the, the, I would say the golden ratio of music is repetitiveness, having some kind of repetition of a theme, just so that the people uh, who listen to the music can engage and sing along. And then if you overdo it, you've got a Rihanna song with seven words total that are kind of just yeah. repeated over and over. How do you avoid that Absolutely. with AI? Yeah, so, so actually um, it's, it's not like repeating too much is actually not a, uh, a huge problem because uh, we can easily say, you know, for example, don't, don't repeat uh, more than twice or three times a, a certain theme uh, in, in, a, in, a, in the same song. Uh, it's, it's actually not that complicated. What's more complicated is to make sure that whatever change you bring to the song, whatever novelty you bring to it is actually meaningful and not just completely disconnected from whatever comes before. So I've heard it said about Mozart, about Beethoven, that they weren't necessarily better composers. They weren't more musically skilled. It's that they put in the reps. They literally made that many more symphonies and orchestras than everyone else. So it's not that all of their stuff was better. It was the good stuff that they made was a hell of a lot better. Is that true? And does that mean eventually AI powered music will ultimately win? Because like you said, you can analyze 30,000 sets of music pretty quickly with Ava. Right. So I think there's definitely some kind of truth to it. Like, first of all, as a human, uh, you know, the more you compose, the, the, the more things you learn how to do better. Um, and, and it's definitely an intuitive thought. Um, but also, I think that just from the law of numbers, uh, if you create 1000 compositions, you're just more likely to have at least one of them being a gem uh, r rather than uh, than if you're just composing 10 or 20, you know, like uh, if you're an amateur composer and you haven't composed that many pieces, it's really hard for you to become a great composer just because you've, you've created so few compositions, you haven't really discovered yourself as a composer. Uh, so I think if you create more, there's just more likely that you'll have more great pieces of music. I mean, uh, you know, I think it, it applies in anything. And, uh, the, the more you try something, the, the more likely you are to, to be successful at it just because you tried it more. Um, but at the same time, I don't necessarily think that uh, AI will all of a sudden dominate uh, human music because uh, there's this level of subjectivity in appreciating music. Like, for example, you're, you, you, you can uh, prefer Beethoven's music, but not everybody likes uh, Beethoven's music, even though he's recognized as a great composer. Uh, some people actually prefer more simple music. Actually, some people would prefer Rihanna to Beethoven. So there's a huge level of, uh, of subjectivity in music that I think uh, even if AI creates music that's meaningful and more complex than human music, it's not necessarily going to, uh, to be more appreciated. It's, uh, it, it might be, but it's, it, it might not be the case as well. Let's deal with scale and numbers. How long would it take Ava to compose something relatively original and how long would it take a traditional composer? So uh, for, we use different algorithms to do different types of projects and different types of compositions. Uh, but the, the most powerful and quick ones that we have, they can compose music in 30 seconds. And this is actually what, what you can do uh, if, you, if anyone connects to our, uh, to our online service, they can create music literally in 30 seconds. Um, for a composer to create music, uh, let's say a two, piece, a two minutes piece of music, it, it really depends. Like actually, if you were improvising, it could take you literally two minutes, so just real time. Um, but I would say that uh, the, the, the real, uh, you know, the real um, uh, benefit of being a human and composing music is that you can iterate on it. And iteration is not necessarily something that AIs can do as well because they don't necessarily have appreciation uh, for music. Um, so, so it may take you know, a couple of days or even a couple of weeks to perfect the track as a human, but then that may actually end up being worth it because eventually the, the end product might be better. Uh, but in terms of scale, in terms of, of speed, it's, you know, the AI is obviously definitely much faster than a human. When it comes to something like creativity, where an AI doesn't necessarily have that perspective, how do you focus on improving the output? Is it some type of, um, basically where the neural nets fight each other, reinforcement learning, or is it something to do with humans grading this? How do you take, how do you take Ava from beginning stages to Hans Zimmer? Right. So, uh, so there's definitely uh, 
stuff that we're trying to implement at this stage of like sort of automating the, the evaluation process. So for example, our users can tell us when they like a piece or they can delete a, a composition when they don't like it. So we, we track all this information. However, um, one thing that, uh, that we do uh, mostly and a lot to improve our system is that we actually have human creation and human uh, sort of uh, evaluation. So whenever we you know, uh, launch a new style of music that AI can compose in, uh, we always evaluate that style of music uh, with our human ears to, to understand if something's wrong or not. And, um, and then we actually uh, go back to, to the way that the music is composed by, uh, by our machine learning algorithms and we, we have a very modular approach on the technical side of things. So it means that the, um, the music is composed uh, in, by blocks. So for example, the, the melody is composed first and then you know, the, the harmonies are, are composed and then the, the uh, accompaniments and instrumentals and rhythms are added afterwards. So we sort of, uh, we can easily detect when, uh, when you know, there's something wrong in one of those processes. For example, a melody is being played by the wrong instrument or maybe it's uh, it's just not a natural melody to to play because it's too fast. Uh, so we can actually you know pinpoint exactly what the problem is with our human ears, and uh, and go back to the uh, to the composition process and improve that. If you had to bet your money, how many years off are you from being able to pull off a Hans Zimmer in terms of quality? Uh, that's I think. Uh, in terms of like fully automated uh, AI, both on the composition side and the performance side, because you know the, the compositions that Ava writes are notes, but then we actually need to perform them with virtual instruments. Um, I would say that we're, we're like probably two uh, two years to realizing consistently uh, like a Hans Zimmer, uh, but uh, at the same time, I think from co compositionally speaking, if you just look at the notes. I think uh, there's been some uh, some great outputs that Ava's created out of the box, and uh, and actually we do a, we we do Turing tests all the time, and uh, with both professional composers as well as uh, people who know nothing about music, and a lot of the time uh, you know when we uh, for example give a score to an orchestra, a, a score that's composed by uh, we we give it to an orchestra, um, people cannot make the difference between human composed music and uh, and that score that was performed by humans but composed by AI. That's interesting. I've never heard of a Turing test for music. And I, I imagine it'll be something that kind of starts to apply across different areas. A Turing test for communication, a Turing test for music, a Turing test for art. Is that kind of how you see the progression of human understanding of AI? And what happens once we pass that threshold where, holy shit, we can't tell anymore? Right. So I think actually the Turing test for something is very descriptive of the state of uh, development of AI in general. Um, and the reason why I say a Turing test for music is because AI at this stage is very, very narrow in its application. So for example, our AI system is applied to music composition, but of course it could not drive a car. Like if we you know, gave a car to Ava, it would probably crash into the wall. Um, but uh, there are other systems that are very well trained for, for driving cars and um, and like all those AI systems are not capable of understanding uh, general information, just like we humans can, you know, have uh, knowledge, knowledge, knowledge that translates. Um, and, uh, and that's the reason why, you know, it's Turing test for something. It's because AI is quite narrow right now. So even if, you know, we cannot distinguish uh, human music from AI composed music, I think it's not necessarily a scary thought because it's not like if, uh, if AI is going to take everybody's job simply because, it's too narrow to be uh, self-sustaining and it has to be a tool for someone else to use. Um, and, you know, we, we're trying to put that tool, we're trying to put AI in the hands of, uh, of composers that can enhance their, their composition skills and the speed at which they compose music. Uh, we, we're putting uh, this tool into their hands directly. So, uh, so I don't think it's necessarily scary to, uh, you know, to think that AI can create great music if, if it helps other people create even better music. Is AGI plausible in your opinion? Is that something that's plausible, inevitable? And if it is, is there some form of consciousness that comes along for the ride? So I think it's plausible. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, it's inevitable, inevitable because, you know, humans are stupid. <laughs> Sometimes we uh, tend to want to kill each other too much and that, that can uh, affect the, uh, you know, the, the, the rate of, uh, of development uh, or completely stop it. I mean, there's been uh, civilizations that have, uh, that were great and that fell into decadence. So uh, I, I wouldn't say that it's inevitable, but I think it's definitely plausible. 
but I also think that it's not going to happen in the next 10 or 20 years. It's, it's something that uh, will require us to fundamentally understand how our brain works first. Uh, because, you know, the, the, best, uh, the best AI that we, we have in our world is our brain. Uh, but we don't yet understand, we don't yet understand it and we don't yet understand what, you know, really what consciousness is and we don't have a precise uh, definition where a lot of scientists agree upon, upon that definition. So, um, so I think the first step to building an AGI is to first understand the, the closest thing we have to AGI, which is our brain. And then we can try to, you know, build uh, an artificial intelligence that would compete against us uh, in terms of intelligence, at least. Um, in terms of, uh, of what I think about creating consciousness, really, uh, I think that it's 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 really hard to uh, to even know how to build consciousness or to to evaluate whether you've built consciousness until you've actually understood what consciousness is. And, and I think part of that uh, understanding comes from understanding our own brain uh, at a, a very you know uh, um, biological level. So, would you say that? the human body, brain, et cetera, or something that can be modeled with ones and zeros with biology, with physics, or do you think there's something more underlying that? No, I think that definitely we, we can be mapped with, uh, with, with, you know, binary uh, information. I mean, of course this, this, it's probably more complicated than, than uh, what a regular computer is, which is really just functioning with zeros and ones. I mean, uh, from, from my very limited understanding of, uh, of neuroscience, it seems like uh, there may be some, uh, some quantum effects at work in, in the brain. Um, so we don't, you know, we, we can't necessarily say it's, it's a, a binary uh, um, process end to end, but, uh, but I definitely think that the human brain is at its core, a computer, a, a very powerful one and a very well optimized one that's been optimized through, uh, through literally thousands of years of uh, evolution. Um, so I think it's, it should be seen as a, as a, as a, as a piece of, the, of technology, a very well developed technology. Uh, but it, you know, it's, uh, it's also very hard to replicate that technology because right now for us humans, it's a, it's a big black box. We don't understand how we think. But in theory, if we could replicate it, it would mean we had conscious functioning AI that would also have personality. Yeah, probably. I mean, I think if we can re replicate the brain, we, we could probably create uh, an AI with personality. Does Ava have personality? What do you think about Asimov's books? So, so it's interesting. Uh, I, I would say that Ava's personality, not necessarily like a, a human-like personality, but I think it, it's an AI that has personality just because we're talking about music and music uh, you know, makes you feel emotions. Um, and when Ava creates a piece of music, there's definitely like some, some things that the AI will do and uh, that are either super predictable or actually completely unpredictable. And that makes you smile, you know, makes you react, or at least makes me react in a certain way. Uh, so I think for that reason, it has a certain character um, that, that, you know, uh, triggers emotions indirectly because it's composing music, of course, that, that is the reason of the, of the emotions. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that Ava is a personality for that reason. Do you think it's dangerous having that outsider perspective? For instance, you might have a dog and the dog makes you happy and he smiles and he poops and pees and he wants to come and cuddle with you. And you kind of inherently associate human traits. He's loyal, he's brave, he's cowardly, he's whatever these different human thoughts are, we kind of assign consciousness and human-like attributes to it because that's what we perceive and that's how we're designed to think. In theory though, perhaps those things are there, perhaps they're not. So it'll, it'll be the same with AI eventually. Will it get to the point where we imagine AI, specifically if we make human type androids, we assume they're conscious even though they're not in a West world or anti West world like scenario? So I think it kind of um, this this whole dilemma of when when do we reach uh, you know the, the state of uh, of having created a conscious mind or, or not I think it, it all boils down to first understanding what consciousness is because I, I personally wouldn't even say for sure that uh, for example an animal is not conscious maybe animals are conscious they're just you know conscious at a different level than we are and I think for AIs it might be. It might be similar. It might it might be that we create a consciousness that it's fundamentally different from ours, and uh, and it might be the, the actual point of doing this um, to have uh, something that can help us learn new things. 
Um, but uh, it's, 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 I think the, the, the fiddly thing about consciousness is that because we don't have a definition, it could very well uh, end up being very different from ours. Uh, you know, the, the one that we built for AI eventually. Yeah, it's kind of like there was a Supreme Court justice and they were having a ruling about internet porn and the, the d way that the judge characterized it is, I know it when I see it. And it's, it's <laughs> one of those things that it's very, it's very hard to describe. What is a consciousness if it's different than how you think about yourself? It's, uh, it's challenging. I wanna, I wanna pivot a little bit. So deep fakes and the technology we have now to replicate voices, replicate video, create them. How do you think about the technology you're creating and then a lot of the potential implications? Yeah, so in terms of uh, deep fakes and, and deep learning that's used to generate deep fakes, I think that it's uh, important to be aware of the problem and to have uh, you know, some ideas on, on how to solve it. But I would say also that it's not as big a problem as what people think it is. Like for example, um, Hollywood studios, when they want to replicate a character in a movie, as faithfully as possible, they don't use deep neural networks. They use uh, traditional CGI methods, um, and and those methods are usually involve a lot of uh, human, um, you know, either human capture, motion capture, or um, or you know, human uh, made models uh, that are crafted by by human beings. Um, and I think that definitely tells you something that um, that uh, deep fakes are not as scalable uh, in in their you know bad usage as what people might think. Um, and there's actually a lot of, um, a lot of uh, ways to detect whether uh, um, a deep neural network has generated a deep fake or not. And, uh, and I think for this reason, we, sh we shouldn't really freak out about them, but it's still important to you know, understand how we can uh, make sure that in the future when they become very scalable, we can, you know, uh, in a very uh, objective way and, and secure way, we can stop them. And we can, uh, you know, label deep fakes, deep, deep fakes compared to uh, to real information. Is this going to be like the cops get bulletproof armor, the robbers get um, armor piercing bullets? You kind of have to keep pushing the envelope. So you, you build a you build a browser, you build a Chrome extension that will automatically identify deep fakes. Deep fakes have to keep continuing, but you basically have to rely on AI to fight AI. Yeah, I mean it's it's a bit like uh, like malwares. Uh, you know, you didn't have malwares when you didn't have computers and uh, Computers are the reason why we have malwares, but they're also the reason for why we can fight malwares. So, yeah, in this case, it's, it's going to be a, always a, a, an arms race that nobody will win. It's just a matter of uh, always, uh, always making sure that, um, that we have uh, enough people putting enough efforts into, uh, into containing this problem. But uh, it, it's just like with anything, you know, like with cars, you know, we have cars on the road. And sure, if you, if you decide you could cause a lot of intentional harm to people with a car, you could you could essentially crash in, in, their, in their cars or whatnot, um, but there's sufficient amount of laws and rules and, and you know, monitoring for that to happen in the, at, you know, what we think is a, what we hope to be a, a small scale. But it's got to be the default. So it can't be something that people decide on. Look at how many people fall for stuff on, I mean, almost everything on Facebook that gets shared. It's just not true. It's something that's either designed to be shared or designed to influence you. But People don't really realize that, especially your well, your parents, people that are of that of that age that don't realize that they're being fooled by Facebook and the internet because they don't have the type of savvy for that. This is something we have to force on people because otherwise, oh my God, Trump just said this. Well, you know what? It it wouldn't be all that out far outside of the realm of possibility, so to speak. Is this something that we can afford for? it to be in people's hands or does this have to be forced to be protected? So I think that actually the, this problem is not inherent to technology. Technology is changing the scale of things, but uh, for example, misinformation is something that's always been there. I mean, uh, not necessarily in, a, in an in intentional or harmful or, or in, you know, a mischievous way, uh, like people around you will tell you facts that have been, you know, slightly, um, uh, modified by their perception of the world. And I certainly know that uh, being raised in, in my family, I've had, you know, I was uh, abroad with certain political uh, sort of, uh, of um, understanding of the world. And I'm sure if I talk to someone from another family who were raised in a different sort of uh, political upbringing, they, they would have a different opinion about the world. Um, and I think that Facebook or, or social medias in general 
sort of reflect that you tend to follow the people that uh, have the same opinion as you or you tend to to uh, to you know check news sources that agree with you or that you you agree with and uh, and because of that scale it's then you know tracked and monitored and it's easier to track um, who is listening to what and then at scale we can uh, spread misinformation much more easily so I think it's the the, the problem of technology is the scale of um, that it, that it um, sort of uh, you know, um, propagates uh, problems that are deeply human at the core. Um, so I think it's it's really all about making sure that we reduce uh, the effects of that of those problems, uh, reduce the scale of those problems by you know building tools like uh, reviewing or uh, or ranking based on on you know what other people might think of this. Um, but at the end of the day, it's 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 really a problem that we had before any kind of technology emerged. It's just like the scale is different now. For every level, there's another devil. And when you, when you go up, it gets bigger and bigger, the size of the problem. How do, you think right. about, how do you think about the value of art, craftsmanship, creativity going forward, where AI does start to become on par with a lot of at least creative tasks and especially less creative tasks? So for instance, you might pay X to get a handmade incredible samurai sword but just to have one mass produced at a factory it's not quite the same you didn't have the master swordsmith pounding it out in japan creating it do you think we'll have similar dynamics where ai composed ai created products content entertainment etc has less of a value so to speak in the eyes of the consumer so i think that ai music is actually going to not replace uh the the sort of use cases for music that uh, are deeply attached to uh, to the human component like for example if you go to a concert you know it's still going to be human composed music uh, performed by humans that you're going to see even in a hundred years time like i i would be willing to uh, <laughs> bet my money on that um and the same applies to listening to music around the campfire you're trying to play some music you're, you're really doing this just because it's enjoyable and, and it's in social and not necessarily because you're the best uh, uh, musician in the world. Um, but at the same time, what AI can do is allow music uh, to be used in different ways. And for example, uh, there's a lot of interactive content nowadays that are created, like uh, video games. And those video games have hundreds of hours of gameplays uh, and you know, increasingly uh, highly interactive stories where you can make your own choices. And based on those choices, uh, the story will change. and uh, and you know, why not the music? Because right now the music is static. It's about two hours of music in a, in a big video game. Uh, so it means it looks 50 times over. And uh, what if AI could actually create personalized interactive music that changes based on what you do? It's something that humans cannot touch, cannot do, because obviously no humans in the world can, uh, can, can create hundreds of hours of music. But uh, it's definitely something where AI can, can add value and, uh, and stand out rather than, you know, compete against humans. And even in this scenario, I feel like uh, the human um, development of the, the creative vision for the soundtrack would be very important. So, for example, they say, you know, this this uh, this uh, particular game is set in the in the desert. So, I want to have Middle Eastern instruments uh, to reflect the mood of the piece. Um, and you know, these are things that uh, a composer would have to come up with, like to determine the uh, the overall arc and uh, emotional arc and, uh, and and vision for the score. But then once, um, once a bit of music is being composed uh, by the composer, an AI could take over and, and create more content and, and enhance that content uh, to be more personalized and more interactive. So I think that there's definitely going to be uh, different use cases for both AI music and human-powered music. So it's probably going to bring different type of value. But I, I still think that you know, the... The, the value of human music is not going to be denied or, or replaced. It's, it's still going to be highly, highly valued because, you know, when, when you like a composer, I mean, first you listen to the music, then you like the music. And then uh, sometimes uh, what a lot of people do is that they, they buy a ticket to, to see their, the, that musician in the concert or they learn more about the, the, the history of the, of the composer and they're interested in their stories and why they compose that particular piece of music. And that's something that obviously you can't have with, uh, with an AI. I feel like that dovetails nicely into the problems with personalization. So Ready Player One was an incredible book about a dystopian VR world where everyone was plugged into the 
for lack of a better term, the matrix, and living their lives within this virtual world. And that's not exactly how it would play out. We've already seen from Facebook and people's self-selection into different topics. What happens isn't one world where everyone joins. It's everyone gets their own individualized world that's the most extreme and epic version of exactly what they want. Is that almost inevitable when it comes to possible progressions of VR? So it's not going to be a game getting created. It's going to be a game for every individual where you have a choose your own adventure of, oh, Matt's heart rate's accelerated. So let's give him something exciting here and let's blast the music there. And well, this guy's interested in redheads and that girl's interested in big, strong, sexy guys. And he's always wanted to climb a mountain, but suddenly we can sense his, we can sense his, um, basically are things going to get so personalized where, as you see in a lot of things in the real world today, the real world just isn't the same level of stimulation and excitement. And people go for the thing that's amazing over the thing that's just everyday life. So actually, I think one of the things that, that makes the, the, our world so exciting is that there's also a lot of unexpected and um, I think that complete personalization, uh, extreme personalization is not a good idea. And uh, for me, when I, when I talk about personalized uh, music, I talk about music that you like, that you know you will like, and that matches your expectations, but also sometimes music that you do not expect at all. Because sometimes when I'm, you know, when looking for new music uh, or like when I'm just listening to music and, and, uh, I, and I completely randomly stumble upon this new artist that I never heard of before and I hear this, uh, this new piece of music and it's great, then it's like the best feeling in the world. You've, you've discovered a gem, which is a really hard thing to do. And, uh, and, and, and it expands your, your sort of uh, musical uh, appreciation to new styles. Progressing. Sorry? With spontaneity. But can you, exactly. can you engineer that? So when you have 7 billion sets of data points with billions of data points per person, can, is there an optimum formula like with the golden ratio of Matt wants something spontaneously unexcited every day or every two days or every four hours? Is that not something I mean, where split testing being what it is, especially as we have more and more powerful computers and living possibly inside of virtual simulations, can you not create that same level of spontaneity i mean spotify pandora kind of already do it people watch netflix and if you watch if you've watched enough netflix films they're all really canned sea level movies they're a six and a half on imdb they're really not that exciting they're just pulling the data figuring out exactly what story arcs they need finding exactly the characters they need and people are suckers to watch it yeah but um actually for spotify i'm a big user of spotify i love their service but in terms of the playlists, um, the, the, the big uh, negative point for me is that uh, let's say you're on a binge to listen uh, to jazz music, uh, then your entire playlist becomes jazz music and nothing else. And I think that's, that's a problem. Um, so I think spontane spontaneity is really hard to engineer because it's kind of counterintuitive to the point of, uh, of uh, going against your... Uh, um, you know, your engagement metrics uh, when you're building a product, uh, you actually have to go against that to, to bring some kind of serendipity in the system. So I think it's, it's almost, uh, almost entirely noise that has to be, uh, to be built into the system where you can randomly choose something different. doesn't mean that that different thing should be completely weird and, and uh, experimental, but it could be like a completely different style of music that you did, did not expect. Uh, and I think that's, um, you know, that's a, a dangerous thing uh, to do for a, someone who creates a product because you, you then can less uh, effectively uh, predict if users will like it or will engage with it or not. But it's an important thing to do, I think, from uh, security, from uh, uh, the point of view of, uh, of wanting to not create the same content and re replicate always the same things and, uh, and streamlining everything to, uh, to each user. Um, so, so yeah, I think, I think serendipity is to be built in a, in a very aggressive way with, with noise, essentially. I feel like with EEGs and with enough biofeedback, you would be able to tell in terms of people's stress levels, people's concentration levels, you'd be able to see, I imagine when people's attentions, their focus, their enjoyment with what's happening is 
dropping and that's when you inject it in there, so to speak. I, yeah, so, I, I, you know, I don't know for a fact, but it seems to make sense. Yeah, so you, you, can, you can measure after, a fact, after the fact, but I think predicting is harder. Um, and also because uh, measuring is great, but it's highly contextual. Um, like you, you may, for example, let's say, uh, let's talk about uh, heavy metal. Like I actually listen to some heavy metal sometimes, but it's very, at very, very specific moments. Because otherwise in other moments, it, it may just feel too aggressive to, or too weird. Uh, and my body will probably have a complete opposite uh, reaction of when I actually listen to heavy metal. Um, so, so I think it's it, measuring uh, biological response, I think is highly contextual. Uh, and probably at some point we'll be able to understand the, the context around certain emotions. But at least right now, it's, um, it's I think, a very complicated uh, problem to solve. Will automation create or destroy more jobs? And it doesn't have to be on a massive scale, but just is it a positive, is it a negative in terms of jobs overall? So I think it's going to be a uh, positive uh, because it's, it's not always intuitive for, uh, for us humans to sort of predict what will come next. Like for example, if you, I'm sure if you asked people 40 years ago, uh, you know, what would be uh, one of the, uh, the well, most well-paid uh, jobs uh, on earth, they wouldn't say, uh, you know, uh, tech uh, developers or, or like a deep learning engineer, like uh, AI engineer is probably one of the, you know, one of the safest carriers you can have right now because it's the most uh, uh, sought after. Um, but 20, 30 years ago, I'm, I'm sure that people would not have expected this, uh, this profession to be something uh, to even exist. Um, and, and I think it's probably counterintuitive now to figure out what will be the next big profession or, uh, interesting profession in, in the next 20 years. And, uh, and so that's the reason why I'm saying, I think it's actually going to create jobs, create new opportunities that we don't necessarily understand uh, and probably not replace as quickly as we think, because, um, you know, it's, it's one thing to create music uh, quite well with an AI. It's another thing to create music quite well in any type of scenario uh, for like a very demanding film director, for example, who wants to, uh, wants to have a very specific soundtrack uh, that's tailored to each and every frame of his, uh, of his film, his or her film. And, uh, and, and usually uh, what, they, what they like those type of people is to have an emotional connection with a human, a composer, to talk to, to get advice from uh, and, and to, uh, to work with towards a, a bigger vision. Um, and I think those people, for example, they, they, they you know, they, some, some of them uh, who don't have budgets, they turn to AI to help them uh, create their stories. But, um, but a lot of those people who have a budget, they would definitely go for, for a composer who might use technology to enhance uh, their work. But at the end of the day, uh, they're talking to a composer, a fashion block composer to, uh, to craft their soundtrack. Same question, but artificial general intelligence, more jobs or less jobs? That's a great question. I think it, it all depends on, uh, on the type of AGI that, that we build. Uh, for me, it's not as intuitive to, to know what type it's going to be because it could very well be uh, an AGI that's still somewhat um, you know, tied to us humans. Like either it's, a, it's an augmentation um, uh, interface uh, or, or it's a completely sentient and, 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 and sort of uh, individual system. Which um, you think is more likely? I think the uh, augmentation uh, path is probably the most likely uh, simply because it, it makes like from an evolution standpoint, I think it would be quite silly to try to make something that potentially could replace us, but something that would work for us or with us, yeah, I think is, it makes more sense. Just like cars is be, uh, has, have been a augmentation system essentially because they've allowed us to get from point A to point B much faster, but they always required a human. And I think in the same way, uh, AI could be plugged into us and, and we could, uh, we could, you know, live with it rather than like um, live against it almost. Let's play devil's advocate. Man's reach almost always exceeds his grasp. And we're, we, we had the animal example before in terms of, are they conscious? We had, the, Jesus, we had the same thing with slaves in the past of, oh, they're just, they're just animals. They help us on the farm. And you know what? That's just the natural order of things. Is man's arrogance enough to assume that he can control something that possibly he cannot? Yeah, it's probably uh, it's, it's probably not guaranteed that it's going to end well, uh, but I think that uh, it's it's also like it's also danger, but it's it's not going to be uh, 
it's not going to be stoppable. I mean, if we can do it, I think it's going to happen and we just have to embrace that and to make sure that we approach the steps towards development in a, in a, you know, in a safe way. Um, but, um, but I think it's, it's not necessarily that something that you can stop, at least if it becomes technology, technological, technologically viable, it's not something that we're going to be able to stop. And even it, it, we just have to make sure that we're approaching this with, uh, you know, the less amount of arrogance and, and, uh, and, and you know, uh, the most, you know, the biggest amount of empathy. Um, I think that's, that the, that's the way to approach it. How would you ensure something like that if I gave you a magic wand? That's a very good question. Um, I think that the the best way to sort of engineer a system that um, is not going to um, you know replace us or whatnot is to always have a component that relies on humans. Uh, for example, you know, in in our case, um, as narrow as our AI is. Um, you could very well start to make uh, uh, an AI system that that just so continuously upload music on online and uh, and just drowns the market with a ton of content and then eventually it becomes a problem but in our system you know there there needs to be humans to do that like to upload the music and to create it and to specify parameters so i think in its design it's not harmful because it's not going to you know like uh, uh tomorrow it's not going to upload randomly like a million compositions on youtube and then flood the, the systems. Um, and I think that with, uh, with designing uh, AGI, it's probably the same. We should have some kind of, a, of aspect of the design that still requires some kind of human input, uh, even if the system itself is, uh, is, is, um, is, uh, is autonomous and, and, and individual. Uh, like for example, I think with humans, uh, like from human to human, we, we have that dependence, that dependence of, uh, of knowledge and transferring knowledge and, and teaching knowledge, uh, like if, if you're if you're born alone in the in the wilderness, you will not develop uh, speech, you will not develop the ability to talk, or you, your your thinking will probably be lessened um, than if you're if you're uh, you know taught from a young age to read, how to read, how to communicate, and so on. So I think with AI, it's the same thing. There should be a, a sort of way for us to pass knowledge and to uh, to to have a, a control over you know, uh, over its, uh, its ambitions. Isn't software a bit like a Lego building though? I can change out the red block for the blue block pretty easily. And suddenly I have something very different. Like for instance, the NSA designs all sorts of programs and then, oh shoot, we accidentally let one get out and suddenly we have ransomware around the world. Could you not see a similar scenario even just with Ava where someone manages to get control of Ava and then blows up YouTube puts out 10,000 versions of some band song and is able to do that because they have that scale. Isn't it relatively easy to change these systems? I think in some cases it can be very easy depending on, on uh, how, you know, um, how the harm is done. But I also think that in other cases, it's, it's really complex. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's not, it's not something that you can pick up. For example, uh, turning a, a nuclear power plant into a nuclear weapon uh, requires you to have knowledge of uh, you know, uh, nuclear engineering and, uh, and, and physics. Uh, you can't just do that uh, with, a, with a high school degree. So I think it's, um, if, you're, if you're into the, that community that builds these systems and your intentions are wrong, then that's probably the, the, the biggest problem. It's, it's like a, if the, the people who create this type of technology were involved in this type of technology um, are, you know, are, uh, have uh, ill intentions, then that, that, that's a problem, uh, regardless of whether existing products are, are aimed towards good or bad. Um, but that's the, the, for, the I think the, the, the strength of technology is because it can be changed so quickly. Uh, it means that uh, if we have enough good actors to regulate the bad actors, it, uh, it you know, it's, it's a sort of a symbiosis. I mean, it, it's never perfect, but it somewhat works. And uh, as we've seen with uh, nuclear weapons, we're not in like an ideal scenario where uh, nobody has nuclear weapons nowadays, but it's been uh, regulated uh, since the Cold War. And, uh, and now we have less in circulation than, than we had before. And over time, hopefully, uh, the number will even decrease lower. Um, so I think that, that it's uh, the, 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 the main issue is how long does it take humanity to catch up uh, to, to danger, to incoming danger. 
um, that I think that's the the main worry that we should have, like uh, nuclear weapons. If we had been too slow to to react to the to the danger that they that they caused, it would have obviously been problematic, and it could have started like a, a nuclear war between the between the two blocks. But so, uh, thankfully, we've ca uh, we've caught up uh, quickly enough. But I think we should uh, always make sure that we're getting quicker to to catch up to new threats, like you know AGI, for example. I'd agree. I feel like with AI, the barriers to entry are at least a thousand times lower than nuclear weapons, just number of countries, number of companies, et cetera. But part of my job as well is to play a little bit of devil's advocate because I find technologists are incredibly optimistic and oftentimes don't think about right. possible negative consequences. Because if you're thinking about negative consequences, why go build an awesome future? You just, it doesn't work like that. What, uh, what technology are you, outside of AI, are you most optimistic about and why? Um, I, I am actually quite optimistic about, uh, about VR because, uh, I mean, I think that just like, just like any good thing, uh, there can be addictions like, uh, you know, drinking or eating or Facebook, uh, or, Facebook. <laughs> uh, or, or, you know, or gaming, uh, you know, all those things can, can be done in a, in a very healthy way. They can also be done in a very bad way. Uh, but I think that. VR can be very exciting um, in, in terms of allowing people, for example, who have reduced mobility uh, to experience new things uh, or for us to actually experience new things, but also learn how to appreciate our world more. Uh, and, and I think that sometimes it's, it's kind of the, uh, the amazing thing about things that are available um, you know, instantly. You know, they, they give you instant gratification but also over time that that sort of effects sort of wears down uh, and if you don't get addicted and it makes you appreciate it, appreciate certain things more. Uh, I think, for example, uh, Spotify definitely did this to me. I love Spotify. I love the service, but I, I also enjoy when, uh, when, you know, it's not like Spotify's algorithm that, that are servicing music to me, but rather like my friends sending, sending me music or, or just, uh, you know, walking in the street and, and hearing random musicians play, play music. I think that's, that's uh, that that makes it so uh, so much more powerful because now I have uh, so much music uh, ready on my phone that I can play at any time. But at the same time, uh, when when someone like uh, with, with a lot of serendipity plays a piece of music in the street and it's beautiful and you did not expect it, it's like a beautiful moment that uh, that I think is irreplaceable. There's only one animal in nature that scientists have found that doesn't want to work at least a little bit for its food, and that's your general house cat. But everybody else, they, they've done experiments. They used to make those at-home baking cakes. And moms didn't buy them because everything was built in. Just add water, throw it in the oven, and it's good. And moms were like, well, it doesn't actually feel like I'm doing anything more than just buying a cake at the store. They take the eggs out. They take the milk out. Golden. You have a massive industry. Because people want to feel like they're doing something that at least a little bit matters to get the reward. Right. And I think that also sometimes... Uh, you know, you, you buy these, uh, these ready-made solutions and you try them out and, and they're great to sort of get started with something uh, like completely unrelated to, to music or food. But uh, uh, I, I actually um, uh, started making my own beer with my brother uh, because we bought these uh, sort of ready-made kits uh, and, and we started putting things together. So the, 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 the sort of already made mixture with, with some water, some sugar, some yeast, and so on. And, and then we, we started making our own beer. And then we became more interested in, in, in making all the ingredients from scratch. And, uh, but we, I, I don't think we would, have, we would have made the first step if we didn't have this sort of introductory kit uh, for, for complete uh, newbies like us. Uh, and I, I think that it's the same with cooking. It's the same uh, with music. We see a lot of uh, user, users of Ava that uh, have no knowledge of music. And, and then they get more interested in, uh, in becoming serious about music. Uh, so I think that's a positive thing. Of course, there's going to be negative uh, consequences to any sort of technology, but but I think that uh, there's definitely also very positive things that come out of it. Yeah, they hand out samples at the grocery store and uh, at the corner. And you got to get people hooked on something exciting to get them to go further. I want to jump into the patron only bonus section now. So if you guys haven't supported us yet, we do three to four bonus questions with every awesome guest, every episode. If you go to disruptors.fm slash Patreon and support us at a level of $5 or more per month, something that helps us keep the lights on, keeps me caffeinated and it can help our team with producing this show, which is incredibly hard to get incredible guests on like Pierre. 
then consider supporting us, disruptors.fm slash Patreon. Let's jump into it. I'm back into the episode now. So Pierre, back to the episode. What was it like giving a TED Talk? Was there a ton of pressure behind that? Did you know how things were going to perform, how people would re- receive Ava and what you've been working on? So actually, I was not, I didn't really have too much time about uh, thinking about um, how people would react to Ava uh, because you know, I had to figure out uh, what I would look like on the stage. <laughs> um, and, and surprisingly, I think it was, uh, I did, first of all, it was an amazing experience. I mean, when you stand on that red dot, there's something magical about it. Like the, the whole room is set in a way that you don't feel, um, you, you know, it doesn't feel like you're being um, confronted to a big audience, but rather you're like with the audience and you're talking to, to people in the audience. And it's, it's a wonderful feeling that I did not expect. Uh, and also at TED, there's, there's really wonderful people and wonderful speakers that I got to meet as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was, it was, a, it was definitely like uh, intense and, 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 you know, uh, the, the expectations were high. But also, I think that it was, um, in a weird sense of way, it, it was it was just really part of, like the the way that the uh, the TED team uh, approached me and 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 coached me uh, through this entire process was very organic, and it, it never felt forced at any stage. Uh, so I think that probably helped uh, make it smooth and make it seem you know relatively easy compared to what it seems like it is. Plus, you had something awesome to show off. What was it like? I, I want to say you said you helped your dad with producing several feature length documentaries or videos before the age of 15. What was it like having an alternative lifestyle like that? Um, it was, yeah, it was, uh, I guess it was normal for me because I always kind of felt like I had to do something like even at the age uh, 11 or 12, I can't remember exactly, but um, that was, you know, that was as early as I remember uh, trying to program uh, a computer uh, programs um, and and websites after that. And I was always like trying to do something like even I, I remember dabbling into uh, 3D uh, infographics and 3D rendering and and trying to create 3D models of, of, of characters that I read about in, in, in fantasy books. Um, and, and so I always had my hands on like doing stuff, you know, it was very important to me to keep me busy. Um, and so it didn't feel really strange to me. It was just always how I think I was brought up because my, my parents are very artistic at their core. Um, but at the same time, it, it probably was, um, in hindsight, it was, it was probably very, um, part of, 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 a, of, a, of a learning process uh, of, you know, learning how to, to build stuff, learning how to build stuff that matters. Um, and that was a very important you know, step in my life, I think. How do parents help and society help encourage that? So you kind of played in two different, very opposing realms and it's worked out incredibly well. And I think we're moving towards an era where we need more and better well-rounded people, which is the exact opposite of what society and the education system tries to create. Yeah, so I think um, my parents are, are very entrepreneurial and, and artistic. So they tend to be... Uh, quite contrarian to, to the status quo. And I think that's definitely helpful in that sense. But they're also, they can be very, especially my dad can be very uh, academic, academic about some things. Uh, and so I think it's, it's always striking a balance between, you know, having a bit of chaos, but also having a bit of order in how you approach things in your life. And, and I think that chaos allows you to get to always interested in new things and to pick up new new knowledge, and then being an academic, and make sure that uh, that you can you you can actually follow through with ideas and follow through with projects because it's it's great to have a, a thousand project ideas, but I think it's also important at some point to commit to one idea seriously, and and you know to go for it and c- to grow it, uh, and that's that's how great projects uh, come to be. Um, how do you choose that idea to pursue? Sorry. How do you choose that one idea to pursue when you've got so many great ones? Oh yeah, it's, it, I think it's a, it's a really hard uh, thing to do, but also I think it, it kind of makes sense when, when, you, when you have that idea that really drives you and that where really you, you, you work and you don't necessarily feel like it's work uh, or you're able to connect with other people that are like-minded and that are interested in this idea uh, and, and you know, you're able, able to surround yourself with really passionate and smart people. I think that's when you start to know that you should definitely commit to that and, and drop everything else. Um, and that's also the challenge. Like not everybody can do that. Uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think that it's, it also takes a, 
uh, a different mentality, not necessarily a better mentality, but a different mentality to be able to, you know, to choose uh, one project over another um, or to choose at all or like to want to start projects. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing because we, I think we need everyone. Um, but I think we should definitely encourage this sort of uh, slightly, you know, breaking the rules sort of once in a while thinking uh, that that should definitely be uh, something that we teach uh, people, newer generations. Absolutely. Move fast and break things after you've thought about them at least a little bit. I like it. I think this is a, this is a good place to start to wrap things up before you tell people where to find you. If you had to leave people with one thing, a quote, a call to action, it can be anything. What would it be and why? So I think that uh, kind of, you know, related to the, uh, to, to the, the device that, uh, that I got given quite early on in my life, um, you know, surround yourself with amazing people. Uh, I, I know I have an amazing family that taught me a lot of things. I know I have a, a, a great business partner. Uh, I know I have a great team. And it, the, the reason why I think it's important to, to choose carefully the people that you're surrounded with is because, uh, especially in the professional life, you can have a lot of fun. Uh, you can learn a tr- tremendous amount. And of course, you can, I think, uh, achieve great success if, if people are, uh, are great around you. Um, and um, I think that's, that's really important um, to, you know, to build a sort of meaningful life where, where you, you have a sense of, uh, of um, you know, belonging to a community and a sense of, um, of, of having a goal. I think uh, having a goal is very important as well. You know, having a mission in life is, is very important. And you shouldn't get too uh, uh, dogmatic about it, but it's, it's very important to have a, a goal in life and a, and a purpose. What's your goal in life? To create, uh, you know, personalized music for artificial intelligence. That's definitely my goal. Why? Because I think that more music in the world that can touch more people is uh, always a great thing. And making people more creative it cannot, you know, cannot be a bad thing. And like more music in the world is, is better than uh, than more, more violence. But I'm bumped. That is a good place to start to wrap things up. Pierre, if people want to find out more about you and about Ava, where is the best place for them to check it out? So best way to, uh, to, find, to find us is basically to go to the website. Uh, so www.aiva.ai. And uh, there's actually a chat. It's a company, but there's actually a chat where you can talk to me or you can talk to other people in the company about any questions that you might have uh, about AI music. Or otherwise, you can find me on my Twitter, which is Pierre, P-I-E-R-R-E-B-A-R-R-E-A-U-05. That's my Twitter. And we'll have links in all the show notes, guys. Just, it's always tough to do that kind of stuff. Shoot me over, shoot me over one of Ava's best clips and we'll throw it into the episode as well. I hope okay. you guys have enjoyed this. This has been a lot of fun for me. We're moving towards a, we're moving towards a her world and this guy's building it. Thanks for coming on today, PR. Thank you so much, Matt. It was a pleasure. Thanks for tuning in, guys. And if you run a company you think would be aligned with our mission and values, Matt at disruptors.fm if you want to reach out for advertising. And if you're interested in supporting us, again, disruptors.fm slash Patreon. We have bonus episodes and questions for you guys to help us make this sustainable. Thanks, Pierre, and thanks, guys. Cheers. Awesome, that was good. Yeah, no, that was was great. Thank you so much for for having me.